Good evening again. Welcome to Olivet Baptist Church, and you're joining with us on our Wednesday night Bible study on systematic theology, where we take uh, different Bible doctrines, connect them together, and demonstrate and show how they apply to our Christian walk. You are catching us now on the outline that is provided for you if you're watching online. What help do I have? We previously looked at several weeks ago the help of God's word in our personal walk with him. And now uh, we touched on last week the available help of prayer, Roman numeral number two. And what we've done for you is given you some additional comments. It's an additional to the outline that you have and you see it on the board. Uh, we're picking up at letter A, the nature of prayer, and it is confession. And we're going to add what you see in the original outline. And plus, we have some additional comments that I think will provide for you some more information to help us in these sections specifically that we're looking at. Before we start, let's pray. Ask the Holy Spirit again to bless our time. And then we'll jump right into uh, letter A, the nature of prayer. Father, we do thank you again for your presence in our life. We thank you that we have help in understanding the word the Holy Spirit who illuminates the text for us as we do the work to try and study and learn. And he makes it easy for us to grasp and understand and to apply. So we ask that he again would be the ultimate teacher and that he would show us the depth of confession, what it actually entails, and then to counsel us since he is the counselor provided for us to uh, apply what we're learning individually, corporately as a church body, um, and how we can better enhance our prayer life in the area of confession. We'll be careful to give you the praise for all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to start out by stating in this section that we're looking at on confession that sin causes indifference. The more we sin, the more indifferent we are uh, in terms of God's word and our relationship with him. So it's really important that we get to the nuts and bolts of this topic um, in understanding confession because sin is the thing that makes us turn away from God, turn away from his word. And then we fail to read it, we fail to go to church, we don't want fellowship. It's sort of an interesting thing. Uh, once we don't address it in our life, it causes an indifference in our life. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. They're not in your outline. It's not on the board here. But just to back this up, um, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Um, this is just by way of a, a little introduction that helps us gather a little more information about this topic. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Again, I'll be reading from the NIV version. So here we go. Psalm 139 verses 23 and 24. And here's what it says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the, in the way of everlasting. Now, again, the idea here is the psalmist, is, and it's David, is asking God to examine him, to look at his thoughts, to look at his heart, to test him and see if there's any sin there, anything that needs to be addressed. That's what confession does, uh, and it's the secret in having a clean vessel for you and I. That's one thing that we, and we're going to look at how to do it specifically, but that's one thing that the Christian should do all the time. Self-examination. Paul encourages it. It's the one thing we don't want to do. We want to examine everybody else, but we don't want to look at ourselves. And the idea, as David just showed us, ask God to look at our heart, look at my heart. And so uh, given that, let's look at our outline that you have. The nature of prayer, confession, is the first element that we're looking at. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, we're looking at verses 3 through 6, and then we'll jump to our board. 
on the side. Interesting thing about the Bible, just by way of a little freebie, it has historical history, secular historical history, and it has biblical history. The movie 300 dealt with the Greeks fighting Xerxes, who conquered a lot of folks, made them slaves, and put them in his army. Well, here we're reading about that guy, and it's in Daniel 9, and you read it in your public uh, Western civilization classes also. But uh, chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, so let me start, and it says, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, and in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. So again, self-examination, you know it when you sin. And when you do do that, it's a turning away from God. And if you're a believer, you don't lose your salvation. You lose your fellowship. So in other words, it's like the phone line is clear when you and I are right with God. When there's no unconfessed sin in our life, I can call you, you hear me clearly. Like the mic here, it's clear. But when sin comes in our life, now, we still got the line of connection with God, but we can't get through. The, the phone line, uh, the connection line to God is not clear. We can't hear him until we confess. And once we confess our sin, now we have a clear line where we can hear him and he can hear us. That's our goal as a Christian to constantly take examination of our life and confess sin when it pops up. Don't wait till Sunday. Don't wait until nighttime when the Holy Spirit pricks your heart and says, you know what, you sort of had an attitude with the, the teller or the grocery clerk, and that, wasn't, that was wrong. Okay, and then you confess it while you're walking to your car. I mean, that's the type of relationship we want to get at. Not wait, because the longer we wait, then everything we're doing is in the flesh. Sin breaks fellowship. Now we've gone from being spiritual and filled with the Holy Spirit to fleshly and living in our own efforts. That's one of the reasons why we handed out that booklet in terms of the blue booklet called Being Filled and Understanding the Holy Spirit. That's what happens every time that we sin, we move to the flesh, now we need the refilling of the Holy Spirit, and that booklet taught us how to do it. That's the whole idea here in confession. So, that being said, let's look at an additional to our outline, the necessity of confession. And we're going to look first at Isaiah 59, Isaiah chapter 59. And it's going to be verse 2, 59 2. And this will prove what we just talked about the necessity of confession. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. There we go. Um, this is exactly what sin does. It breaks the fellowship. God won't hear us until we address it. And confession is really crucial in growing as a Christian. The whole point of our walk here is to mature, to be better at uh, being consistent in that maturity. And sin is the one thing that breaks it down, prevents us from doing that. And so um, what we want to do is maintain a consistency in it uh, and be on guard for the little things that the Holy Spirit brings um, 
you know, to our mind. The reason why I say that is because it's the little things that become big things. When you think, oh, that's not a big deal, and a lot of times we just let it slide. No, confess it. If you know it's wrong, confess it, because those little things will build because your heart will become sort of numb to them as you do them, and you'll keep, you'll keep doing it. And then it gets worse. So be on guard for the little things that the Holy Spirit brings up during the time of confession. Uh, one example is if you looked at Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh with the children of Israel? A great example uh, of his problem, he never confessed what he did was wrong. That was the dilemma for him. Even though he was an Egyptian, he could have had a relationship with God, but he never even confessed, never acknowledged it. So what we want to do is recognize the necessity, which is it's crucial to spiritual growth. If we don't do it, we're going to be in trouble. So let me write this down. Isaiah 59, 2, it breaks our fellowship. And one thing we've been talking about Sunday, it's not, we think of sin in terms of certain sins. I'm thinking now of sin as a doctrine, not the what you do or don't do, but the fact of what it does. Uh, I, does that make sense? That, that uh, sin makes us turn away from God. It doesn't make any difference what specific sin Sin in general makes us turn our head from God and turn to the world. That's why it's so critical that we confess when we do it. And thank God we have the Holy Spirit who really, we can't hustle him. He pricks our heart. And he lets us know, you know what, that was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. And so Isaiah 59, 2 the necessity of it, it breaks fellowship. So how do you confess? You just say, I'm sorry. Some people say, I'm sorry. I'm not so sure that that's the biblical definition. So let's take a look at it. One of the best areas to look at concerning sin is Psalm 51. The backdrop to this psalm is pretty incredible. Uh, David as we know, was married, and then he had an adulterous affair with a woman that he saw, and then because he wanted her, look what sin does, because he wanted her, he sets up her husband, puts him on the front lines in a war to make sure he dies so that he can have that gentleman's wife. Look what sin does. See, you leave a little thing, then it gets to be a bigger thing. And now, after that happens, he marries her and never addresses the sin for almost two years. Two years. So basically, for two years, he was living fleshly. Whatever he was doing and singing and playing the harp and doing the music for religious services meant nothing. It was all flesh. Because he had a sin that he never went to God and confessed. So God's not hearing anything. It's just a show now. And so that's the backdrop. There are two verses in Psalm 51. So let me give it to you. Psalm 51, I'll write it here. And we're going to look at a four-fold pattern, for a full four-fold pattern on confession. So let me give it to you, four-fold pattern. We're going to copy what David did. Can you imagine what that must have been to live like year and a half to two years, it had to be dry as heck in his spiritual life. And, you know, maybe some of us have been in a situation like that, where maybe it's not a year and a half, some, maybe 10 years you go south, and then all of a sudden you want to rededicate, you know, you backslide. He was basically, David was in a backslidden state. And so whether it's a year and a half or a week and a half, it's the same thing. 
And so we want to take a look at this and copy it. Two verses, verses 10 and 11. Let me read them. What a psalm. Um, boy, it brings back, a new, I had to uh, talk about this psalm, and it brings back a lot for me. But let me read verses um, 10 and 11. Here's his prayer. Listen to his words. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Verse 11. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. So, uh, the pattern Let's take a look at it from these two verses and see if we can copy it next time we find ourselves in a t time where we've sinned, and it may be in a day. First, the, the pattern that he uh, lays out is there is a cry for holiness. There is a cry for holiness. Where am I getting this from? Well, if you look at verse 10, I think he brings it out. Create in me a pure heart. The word pure in the English here means holy. Pureness, you know, without sin. So he's asking God before he confesses, I need a pure heart. That's acknowledging something's wrong. He's got sin in his life. And so now he's saying um, and asking God to show me what needs to be done. He's basically telling God, okay, take an inventory. You take the inventory of me. What do I need to confess? And, and he's saying, give me that clean heart. Give me that new heart. Um, it's an affirmation that he's requesting that God will do it if we ask him. You know what? And that's the thing that I've found in my personal life. If you're honest, that's all God wants. If you're honest, now, then he will forgive you no matter what. Now, were there consequences for David? Yeah, there, there were some. You know, there were some consequences as a result of his sin. But God forgave him. What's the penalty in the Old Testament for adultery and murder? Stoning. Well, we saw that that didn't happen to David. In fact, at the end of the psalm, he asked God for his ministry back so that he can share about God's love and forgiveness, and God gave it to him. So you can see, even in the Old Testament, even though the law said death, God gave forgiveness as a result of what David did and the relationship that David had with him. It's a wonder how far he fell and yet God said, this guy, he's the apple of my eye. It's an amazing thing. I mean, David, say what you want about him. You know, he made his mistakes. He loved God. And the encouraging thing for you and I is no matter what we've done, he forgives us. I remember once I was in a college classroom, and it was the issue of abortion that came up. Philosophy class. And... At, during the break, the professor told me I am burying girls that had abortions by saying that it's sin. And I remember telling him, to the contrary, I'm giving them a way out. I'm telling them that no matter what they've done, it is a wrong. If they've done it, God will forgive you. What you're doing by telling them that it is not a wrong, they're dealing with the inner soulish issues knowing it's wrong and they don't know how to shake it. And that's the beautiful thing about the living God taking what we've done and can not only forgive you for the behavior, but wipe away the guilt. No human therapist can do that. Only the living God can reach that part of our human soul and wipe away the guilt to feel clean. We saw it with the prostitute when Jesus forgave her, that she felt clean 
And that's an amazing thing. And all of us that are believers know that feeling. It feels good. But you can't get it from a human being. Only God can do it. All right, with that, uh, the second thing that we want to look at under this fourfold pattern is a ask for a divine attitude. Divine attitude. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the verse again and see where I got it from. Uh, and I'm referring to what he says, in, renew a steadfast spirit within me. In other, in other words, renew a right spirit. He wanted it back the way it was before he sinned. It's a divine attitude. Um, a div uh, he wants to be if you will, we can say it in the New Testament, having the mind of Christ again, being right with God, a steadfast spirit, secure, being right with God. That's what he's asking for here. And he says it in verse 10. I should actually put this down on both so you'll know. Verse 10. Verse 10. The first one, uh, A, or number one is the first half. Number two is the second half of verse 10. Then the third thing that we see is to ask for divine guidance. And we see this where he says... In verse 11, do not cast me from your presence. Okay? So what he's saying is, don't cast me away. I want you with me, in essence. I want and I need your leading. Um, when you and I sin, we don't have the leading of, and for us in the New Testament, the leading of the Holy Spirit's not in charge until we confess. We have broken fellowship. The relationship is there. We don't lose that. But the fellowship is broke. Once that happens, our guidance is all fleshly. All the decisions we make, all fleshly. We're using our own intellect and wisdom. And so what David realizes there is now he, he needs God's leading again. He needs God's presence Remember, he was a king. He ran the country. And he runs his personal life. And you and I, when we do even the littlest things, we should be praying about it. Asking God, what is the right way? What is what you want for me today? You may have a loose schedule of how you want to do things and where you want to go, but... If something happens, like it just happened today with my daughter, uh, and I said, you know, Athena, it wasn't meant f today for whatever reason. We don't have to understand it. But what we had planned today for you didn't play out ultimately. So you know what? Practice what you've learned today that from the weeks in past. And next week you'll have the lesson. But for whatever reason... This is not what God wanted for you. And, and then to be okay with it. But you ask him to give you guidance um, and what to do. And, and David needed it. Obviously, he needed it. He was in big trouble. Um, and when you and I sin and don't confess, we're in big trouble. Have you ever made decisions on your own? And you're a Christian. You make the decisions using your wisdom, and you find out you're at a dead end. You know, I mean, hey, and preachers do it too. You know, sometimes they may even do it more because they think they have all this theological knowledge that whatever they do in the flesh is going to be right. And, man, I don't care how many degrees you've got. The BWJ degree is still the best one, been with Jesus. And so if you can tap in and hear his voice and give and listen to it and let him give you leading, you're going to make the right decision. But a lot of times, I've used my human wisdom to make decisions, and 
it, they're dead end. They don't play out. And then on the other hand, there have been the moments when I've trusted God and he said, no, don't do this, do that. And I'm thinking, this makes no sense. I don't see this working, but I was obedient. And guess what? It plays out perfectly because he can see the beginning from the end. I can't. And he knows what's going to play and work best in my life if I'm obedient. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to look back at some of the decisions we made and see what could have been, maybe, you know, and like, oh, man, I took a left turn here, you, you know, and look what, you, you know, I mean, not in a bad way because everything's going to be wiped away that's sinful and negative, but, you know, we're going to, I think, look at something and go, whoa, you know, I wasn't as consistent in my walk. And I had sin there, and I didn't confess it. You'd be surprised how many Christians do not confess their sin all week and wait till Sunday morning. That's a dumb move. That is a dumb move because stuff happens between Monday and Saturday. And we want to make sure that we're right with God in it. All right, number three, ask for divine guidance. And we, just, we mentioned that one, right? Didn't I just say that? I did, didn't I, in, in terms of asking God not to take the whole, uh, cast me out from your presence. And then the fourth one, ask for divine, for lack of a better word, unction, power. I'll put the word power on there, and, and here's what I mean by that. It's God's power. Uh, he says it in verse 11, so let me put this down. This is verse 11. This is verse 11. The end of verse 11, B part. It says, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, keep in mind, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not live inside of God's saints. The Holy Spirit would come upon them for a work. So what David is saying is, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I still want this access. I still need this unction, this, this godly presence, uh, power in my life. Now in the New Testament, the difference is the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And so uh, the, the, the way to ask for that, I think now would be, you know, God, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your, with your, with your power. Um, sometimes we sing songs and the lyrics are not correct. Holy Spirit, fall upon me. Nah, not in the New Testament because he's in you. You see what I'm getting at? And so, um, and, and yet we have this idea, no, he's in us. He lives in us. The better way to probably put it would be, you know, Holy Spirit, take control of me. You know, let me sense your presence in my life. Um, so anyway, that's a freebie. But um, so fourfold pattern. Ask for holiness. OK, we haven't started confession yet. Ask for a divine attitude. Ask for divine guidance. I want you to be guiding me now. This is what I'm, I'm because this is what I'm not doing. And, and I need your divine presence of the Holy Spirit, his power. Um, so that takes us to the third step. And so let me turn the board. Is that clear, Wes? Are we good? Okay. Uh, the third part, what is confession? And the, the best verse that I can think of, you've heard me say it before, is 1 John 1, 9. It's a conditional verse. If I confess my sin, that's the condition. If I don't, nothing happens. But watch the end of the verse. If I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me for my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's the verse. Confession means, to confess means to agree with God.
it means that you're acknowledging what you've done is wrong and you're agreeing with God that it's wrong. Well, if God knows everything, why do we need to confess? Because he wants to make sure that you and I know that what we did was wrong. And once we do that, agreeing with God, we're admitting our guilt. That's why we do it. That's why he wants us to do it. And, it's, and you know what? It's speaking from the heart when you do that. When you're agreeing with God, it's speaking from your heart. Two guys that did it a lot that really impressed me in, in the Old Testament. David, he speaks about it a lot. And guess who else? His son, Solomon. You take a look at those guys and do a character study on them, and you're going to see that those two guys spoke a lot from the heart. Even though they did some wrong things. And what does God look at? The outer stuff? No, the heart. He looks at our heart. And that's the issue. Remember Jeremiah? The heart is desperately wicked. Who can understand it? The question is nobody other than God. And that's the very thing that God looks at, my heart. And doing a 1 John 1, 9 on anything is a heartfelt uh, um sharing with God or confession and it's agreeing with him saying you know what God I this was wrong I did it man darn it you know and I'm so I, I'm asking you to forgive me it hurts me you know that's what he wants that's what he wants from you and I I'm wondering tonight is there something in your life that you need to ask God for forgiveness for and you've neglected to do it you just it's there, but then you don't hear it, and you just move on. Um, I would encourage you to do it, no matter what it is. I would encourage you to do it. Otherwise, everything you're doing is in the flesh, then. That's where we get into problems. Um, takes us to um, letter B, Psalm 66, 18. We're talking about uh, this idea of the heart. 66, 18. So let me read that for you, and then we'll fill in, we'll fill in the blank. Sixty-six, eighteen. All right, here we go. NIV version again. Here's what it says: If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Well, well, that's right. If you liked it and you cherished it in your heart, he's not going to hear. He's not going to listen. So what is this that we're talking about? It's a heartfelt recognition. Heart. And I'm running out of room. Felt. Heartfelt recognition. Um, and... It's the most painful part, I think, in prayer. Because it's the moment you and I admit and recognize the responsibility of two things. Number one, what we did was wrong and we're telling God. And number two, once you recognize it, the change is present. Now I gotta change. I may, may I do it again? Could I repeat that sin? Sure I could. But the very fact that I tell God what it is, and it's a heartfelt recognition, now puts me in the category to change it. Okay? And then, again, this is where growth comes in. Maybe the change is slower earlier in my Christian walk, or even later, if I'm not getting, I'll be honest, if you're not getting good teaching, good luck you know, then the change is going to be slow. If you're growing and learning God's word, then I think the change can be faster because you're getting more truth. You're getting more knowledge. And if you're applying it, it's going to mature you more. So uh, babies tend to repeat things over and over and over and over. Adults may, obviously, but it should be less and less because they're more mature now. They can think. They can analyze better. And that's where we want to be as, as Christians. Um, 
Hopefully that makes sense. Confession is spiritual surgery. Look at it like that. Giving God access to your heart. Giving God access to your heart. Um, there can be no healing within until there is first confession from without. And that's critical. No wonder Satan doesn't want you and I to do this part in prayer. Because this is where it all starts. Everything else is useless until we can clear the slate and get it right with God, where he can hear us and move forward. It's an awareness that um, God wants, and it's surgery. Look at it like a medical doctor going and, and taking a cancer out. Sin, I, I don't want to sound psychological in this. Sin is like a disease. It affects the whole body and spiritually. And then what happens is physically, you know, we follow suit. So sort of like a symbolism, sin is a disease that affects us and we need to address it. And confession is spiritual surgery because now we're agreeing with God. Now we're taking ownership of it and God forgives us. But now we have the responsibility to fight, to do battle. And a smart Christian would say, if I've got a problem, that's why I'm thinking of doing this when we finish systematic theology, is looking at sin more in depth and beating it, if you will, but looking at the fact that now, if I'm sinning in this area, what does the Bible say about that area so I can apply those truths to my life? Does that make sense? A, a lot of people will just quote a verse and it's, it doesn't even relate to the particular sin. Why not find the area in the Bible that deals with the area I'm battling with, exegete the truth from that area, and then apply it. Now I'm going to win. And so that's what sort of, that's my little hobby horse as a preacher, that we get these verses and we throw these promises out, why not go to the right area? You know, at least you're going to know you're getting it right. And so I'm really thinking of doing a whole issue on that uh, and then giving you sort of a glossary of where to go when certain sins fall into certain categories, you go to the right spot in Scripture. I really think, this is my own opinion, I really think the reason why we don't have more biblical counseling it's because we don't know the word well enough to be able to do it. So we go to the secular counselor, who may be a Christian, but the methodology is Freudian. And so you're really getting secular human wisdom, not biblical wisdom. Uh, again, that's my personal uh, idea that this is what I'm seeing. And, 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 and it, it's not the lay people in the church talking about the, the the pastors that's what I'm talking about so the quick fix is let me see what Freud said <laughs> instead of let me see what God said it's there it's all here if it's depression it's in here if it's sexual sin it's in here if it's a temper it's in here if it's stealing it's in here all of these topics are covered and it's our job to seek that truth out and then apply it that's what a smart person does. Um, I will end with this, that have you ever noticed that our, sometimes in our past sins, they still get thrown up to you? Have you ever had that happen where you've done something, you forgive, you've asked God to forgive you, you've confessed it, he's done it, and then all of a sudden, he throws it up and we sort of go into his tailspin. That's imaginary guilt when that happens that's warfare if that happens to you you need to let satan know that you have confessed that quote first john 1 9 let him know that god forgave you for it for the act and the guilt of sin and then tell him to take a hike 
Be because he will try to do that. And, and he'll want you to think you're unworthy to go to God in prayer because of something you did in 1960. And you need to be heads up. That's a hustle game. And he works it. He has gained a lot of victory over Christians that want to pray, but he hits them up with something that they've done, and then they feel unworthy, they feel hopeless, and they stop praying. Big mistake. A big mistake. And the only way to combat these spiritual attacks is that we must take the promises of God's word, and we start with confession and what he says about them. And then it's truth. You need to trust in it because God said it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so, so much that um, no matter what we've done, murder, um, sin is sin. It doesn't make any difference that you died on the cross and rose again, that we, if we choose to accept you as our Lord and Savior, now have access to the promise of confession. That we can confess our sin no matter what it is and get forgiveness. And not just for the behavior, but forgiveness of the guilt and penalty of sin. The penalty is eternal death the consequence is guilt and both of those are removed guilt is removed death physical death we're going to die but eternal death no we have eternal life as a result help us be more open with you to allow you to do spiritual surgery in our hearts Hopefully, that will encourage us to confess more often and keep the slate clean with our fellowship. We learned it on Sunday. Keeping you in the middle of our life where we have intimate, personal fellowship. We can't do it if we're not confessing. So this week, give us a sensitive heart to be open with you, agree with you, and ask you as David did to confess and forgive our sin, to give us your steadfast spirit, to keep your presence there in our lives as a result when we do it, and have the desire to be holy like our Savior. Again, Holy Spirit, thank you for making it simple. Thank you for your word and for penning it and applying it. Now the job is in our court to live it. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.